Hi, I'm Kristen Oaks-White. And I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Well, we're following up a story from last week. You might remember the freeze that came through quickly but left lingering effects across Louisiana. Temperatures even in South Louisiana plunged into the low 20s. The freeze hit right in the middle of sugarcane harvest and the damage is still being calculated. As you can see in this field in West Baton Rouge Parish, the freeze turned green to brown almost overnight. In addition to the obvious brown cane, the freeze also lodged or knocked down cane in the middle of this field. This is a pretty common effect as dead cane is much more susceptible to wind damage. It's all bad news for sugarcane farmers as the freeze will likely sap both tonnage and sugar content from the overall amount. Sugarcane normally sees a freeze or two before the end of harvest, but it's rare for it to be this early in the season. Again, it's too early to know the extent of the damage. Further up north in Avoyles Parish, sugarcane farmer Jim Harper says his cane has seen similar damage. He says he and other farmers are scrambling to speed up the harvest as much as they can in order to get as much sugarcane as possible out for this year's crop. Well, Avery, it's Thanksgiving time, and I don't know about you, but I'm pretty hungry. I am too, and it's a good thing we're at the time of year when farmers have brought in all the bounty we can enjoy. As Twilight's Neil Malonson tells us, there's not only plenty of food, but some good deals out there to make your own holiday feast. With Thanksgiving right around the corner, many folks are wondering what's going to be on the table this year. The people who make those meals, though, are wondering how much it's going to cost. That's why each year the American Farm Bureau does a survey of 16 of the most popular items served in Thanksgiving feasts. The survey shows not only how much consumers should be prepared to spend, but just how affordable it is overall. The good news is that this year compared to last, the price for your Turkey Day feast is about the same. The cost this year is $48.91 compared to 48.91 one year ago, literally a penny difference. As you might expect, some of the items were more expensive and some were cheaper. The Big Bird was actually one of the biggest cost savers this year, coming in at almost a dollar cheaper at $20.80 for a 16-pound turkey. Ham, which is increasingly popular on Thanksgiving tables, is going to be more expensive this year at $9.16 for a 4-pound ham. Stuffing is almost 20 cents cheaper this year at $2.68 for a 14-ounce box. The cranberry dress Dressing is going to be about the same this year, a cent more at $2.66 for 16 ounces. Sweet potatoes are up sharply this year to $3.75 for a three-pound bag. Dinner rolls are a quarter more at $2.50 for 12. Let's move on to dessert. Two pie shells are about two and a half bucks, up a nickel from last year. The pumpkin pie filling is down a penny to $3.32 this year. Finally, a glass of cold milk to wash it all down with is going to cost a bit more, up 18 cents to $3.10 a gallon. A complete list of all the items and prices are available online, including a few that aren't listed here. One of the people who does the survey each year is Denise Canatella. She and her husband Charles are soybean farmers near Melville, Louisiana, and she, of course, shops at Canatella's owned by Charles's brothers. Denise tells us that the survey is a good way of making sure farmers are doing what they do best, which benefits all of us. It is the way, I feel, the way that the American farmer can show accountability and show that we are continuing to strive to provide the safest, most abundant, and cheapest food sources for the American family to put on their table, especially at holiday seasons when they're gathering with all of their extended family. Now, five of the national surveys were done here in Louisiana, and the average classic Thanksgiving dinner here came out to be $48 and a nickel, which is 86 cents cheaper than those same items nationwide. By the way, the survey also looks at the price farmers get for this holiday feast, and for every dollar you spend, farmers only get eight cents. Mm. And guys, I mean, that's just unbelievable. To say. I mean, it is small every year, but it just keeps getting smaller. And when you see, you know, farmers, the bankruptcies nationwide for farmers are up 24 percent, and it just has not crept into our grocery store prices, unfortunately. One of the places where he ha we have an advantage here in Louisiana is sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. We always have a lower price on sweet potatoes. 
and you also have a lot of farmers who will sell direct. So that's one way to, that you can increase the food dollar that the farmer receives. Absolutely, and it's not just sweet potatoes. And of course, you know, a lot of people, especially in South Louisiana, like to mix not just ham into the Thanksgiving things, but a lot of, you know, for instance, Italian sausage you saw at mm -hmm. Canatella's is a big thing for the Italian community there. Other gumbo is, of course, another big one that people love, Cajuns love it's, and during Thanksgiving. So Oyster dressing. Oyster, Oyster dressing is yeah. another one. Yeah. I was surprised. This is the first time I've ever taken the survey and the items that are on there, they're very specific. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, like you said, there were a lot of things I thought, well, this is something that I would con consider a traditional Thanksgiving item that wasn't on there. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a, actually a bunch of new items. You, we'll, you can see all of the items on our website at TwilightTV.org, but they added some new items mm -hmm. this year. So there's, there's a couple of different ways to look at the survey. One of the big things is the ham that we right. included in, in the price you saw in my story. Uh, it's just becoming an increasingly popular item, but due to the uh, African swine flu in China, mm -hmm. the price has just shot up from this year versus last. Well, thank you very much for getting all that, and I'll be expecting an invite for Thanksgiving dinner. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, Louisiana farmers will soon be able to grow industrial hemp. The Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry recently submitted its rules to the state legislature. It's now awaiting the approval of a joint session of the House and Senate Ag Committees. In preparation, the LSU Ag Center held a meeting to let interested farmers and potential farmers know about the issues they must consider before growing industrial hemp. Craig Gotro takes us to Alexandria to teach us more about this versatile crop. Industrial hemp has many uses. It is found in cosmetics, therapeutic applications, and even in some food products. If you take the seed and you can decorticate them, they're actually high in protein and high in oil. So you actually see hemp seeds in various um, consumer edible products. Hemp is a close relative to marijuana, but its THC content the psychoactive material in marijuana is much lower. A recently passed Louisiana law will allow hemp to be grown under certain conditions, and an LSU Ag Center meeting helped inform more than 500 people about issues related to hemp production. I think today's uh, turnout shows that there's huge interest from not only farmers, but people wanting to get involved in processing, selling CBD or other industrial hemp products. Allison Justice has been growing hemp for two years in South Carolina. One part of her presentation dealt with some myths regarding growing hemp. The biggest thing is, well, you're going to get rich quick. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to make money. But at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity to lose a lot of money if you're not doing it the right way. Cannabinoids produce both CBD and CBG. Most hemp-infused products yeah. use CBD oil, but because of its scarcity, Justice believes CBG may be better from an economic standpoint. Right now, CBG is very popular in the market, um, with a lot of that being just because it's, it's rare. You know, there's not, this past year, there's not a lot being grown, probably under a couple thousand acres. Some of the biggest obstacles facing hemp production in Louisiana are there are no labeled herbicides for hemp, and there are many insects and diseases present in Louisiana that can attack hemp. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. The LSU Ag Center has established an industrial hemp working team. Those researchers hope to have some field trials working in 2020. We tell stories on this program every week about the farmers and ranchers that grow the food that goes on your table every day. However, we wanted to show you a way that you can grow your own food in this food themed episode. That's what Twyla's Carl Wiggers is up to this week with one part science project, one part do it yourself and one part gardening. I surely hope all of those will add up to a backyard hydroponic garden that will bring Carl and the rest of us around here, a huge harvest of lettuce that he can share. Hey guys, I'm here in Ravel, Louisiana at the Richland Parish Produce, and they're actually building a new greenhouse right now. It's another, adding to the four that they already have, they actually have two more on their way. So they're really expanding here, and I wanted to learn how to do the same exact thing in my backyard. The hydroponic lettuce is what I wanna grow. So today I'm here in Ravel, and Mr. Rory is gonna teach me how to make that happen. Here are all the parts that I'm going to need to build my own hydroponic garden in my backyard. So as Mr. Rory walks us through all the steps at his greenhouse, I'm going to follow all those steps in my backyard, putting together my hydroponic system. We're gonna start with building the crate that it's gonna set on the box, and we will do it by cutting four pieces of two by four, 28 inches long. That would be the first thing we would do. 
All right, let's mark, we cut to 48 inches. These will be the top rail for the box. Let me two of the short ones down, let's lay a, a long one across the top of it. And we'll go and connect them too. We're building a, a table to set these on, and that way we won't have to build saw horses and we save a little bit more money. Most important is building this level. It maintains constant level in the pipes. We take a 10 foot waste pipe, we will cut this bell off, then we cut it in half and it comes out to be four foot 10 inches. That's what we have on the table with four foot 10 inch sections. Once we get a section cut, we drill using a regular hole saw, we drill three inch holes in this. These are spaced seven inches and it gave me an overlap on each end. Now is that seven inches from center to center? Center to center. When you're drilling these, sometimes it's easier to drill them in reverse. We're going to use regular band strapping. Put this right here and attach it. Put a short piece of two by four between them. All the ends are going to be exactly alike. Now we go, when we get through with this, we're going to run PVC pipe. All right, so the way my system is going to be set up, it's going to come, the water is going to come in on this pipe. It's going to come here into this pipe, all the way down. It's going to come back down this pipe, and then I'll come back around here. So all I'm going to need here is two connectors to go from each of these sets so that water will just continuously flow through all four of these pipes. We will take a piece of uh, three quarter inch PVC. We're going from one end of the pipe with three quarter to the other end. And that maintains a, about a good inch and three quarter level in that pipe for fluid. These are gonna go in here like this. And then this one's gonna go in here like this. Just like that. On this first one, we're gonna make it for the input of using a rubber hose. This is a fountain pump, runs 24 hour continuously, and it will set down in the tank and you'll connect this hose to it, run to your input section. And then when you go to your output, we're gonna come out and go straight down and run a pipe straight down into your tank box. So here we are now in my backyard. I've got my system set up. It's running, water is flowing through it. There's still a few things to tweak make sure it's perfectly balanced because that will help the water to flow evenly, but it works. Water flows through all four pipes and I'm excited about that. I'll be posting updates over the next few weeks as I start to get vegetables in this system. Some lettuce, I got butterhead, red butterhead, green butterhead, and romaine that I'm gonna try out. I've already got those seeded. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll start to see some progress flowing through my hydroponic system. For this week in Louisiana agriculture, reporting from my own backyard, I'm Carl Wiggers. Interesting list there. I didn't see any lettuce in those pipes yet, but that system has room for 56 to grow at one time. It's a lot of greens. Carl wrote a blog post outlining some of the details and some of the headaches of this DIY project and posted that on our website at twilighttv.org. But he's really handy. Built his own desk here he, at the yes, office. Yes, he, he is. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how this comes along. Well, you said you didn't see any heads of lettuce yet. Well, that would mean he would be part magician because he <laughs> just did it two days ago. That would be some magic lettuce beans. You have to have them growing real fast. Yes. After the commercial break, we're going to fire up the flux capacitor and go back in time. Dramatic much. On this month's Field to Feast, we will be going to a classic setting you won't want to miss. Stay with us. I know I hope they're fighting today. I hope they are. Ready to go right here. Cut loose. Find your place in the country. Look at that. And the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Before you sweeten your morning joe. Before the icing on the cake. Before the sugar hits the shelf. It begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. The sugarcane growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane.
I'm a farmer. I am a farm wife. I am a cowboy. I am a grass farmer. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a conservationist. I am an advocate. I am a voice for Louisiana farmers. I'm always learning. I'm a husband. I'm a mom. I am a dad. I'm a granddad. I am a consumer. I grow the food that feeds your family, and I'm proud of it. I am Farm Bureau. 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 We are Farm Bureau. Welcome to Field to Feast, where we profile Louisiana's local ingredients. This morning, we're at the LSU Rural Life Museum, where they're celebrating Harvest Days. We're going to learn how they did Field to Feast in the 1800s. So y'all come join us. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, beef, it's what's for dinner, and by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, think rice. Bill, can you tell me what we have going on here today? Well, this is our Harvest Days. It's an annual event that we have where we bring out a number of artisans, um, folks who are here to show the, the folk ways and the cultural ways of the people in Louisiana in the 18th and 19th centuries. A couple of the demonstrations that we have going on today, we've got a, an outdoor kitchen where they're out there cooking and um, demonstrating the, the ways that you would have cooked over an open hearth fire. Um, we're also making our own cane syrup today. And it cooks down in a large pan, being skimmed and heated and skimmed and heated. And uh, by the end of the day, it'll cook down to the cane syrup that we love to put on our biscuits and our pancakes and put into our recipes. And um, we'll jar it up and we'll have it here at the museum. So we're talking about authentic Louisiana sugar cane. Absolutely. Uh, this, the, they just started pressing the cane uh, this last week, maybe week and a half. And so this is the first batch coming through. Oh, that's exciting mm -hmm. for us. That is very much in the nature of our show. Yeah. Nature yeah. of our show. <laughs> See what I did there? Uh -huh. um, also, I saw that you have bees, honeybees. We do. We have uh, Louisiana beekeepers coming out to talk about um, caring for bees, raising bees, um, and keeping that going. So that brings in another of the, you know, the farm table kinds of uh, food ways and, and traditions. Bill, if you wouldn't mind, could I have you walk us just around a little bit to show us the way? Sure. Over here we have our, our syrup house and um, what we're doing is we're, they're starting to cook. Um, we'll also be cooking cracklins and some kettle corn so that folks can try that as well. Louisiana folk love their cracklin. Yes, they do. <laughs> and we found at the end of the day that um, the uh, cracklins and a little bit of the cane syrup is kind of an extra treat. Why Very in the world healthy too. I, yeah, fat free. Why have I never thought yeah. of that? Cracklin uh -huh. in cane syrup. I think we are on to something here. There we go. So we have um, over here some timber hewing that's going on. Um, and they'll be doing actual hewing and then breaking to, uh, uh, to talk to people as they come through as well throughout the day. So you get the opportunity to see it and then also to learn about what it is that they're doing. Can you tell me what this adorable little structure is? This adorable little structure is a jail. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, well, at least they gave them a, a heater. Yes. That was nice of them. They didn't make them, well, Lord knows you're not going to freeze in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Lucky if you even get a little breeze. What's he doing? Well, this is a forge. Um, we've got the blacksmith shop. And then we've got uh, Mr. Wright here, and he's running an outdoor forge as well. We have... Um, uh, the cabins, trees. Yes. the blacksmith shop. This over here was a, one, a double pen cabin that was converted to a school. We have one over here that was used for the sick house, kind of like the plantation hospital. It's straight out of Little House in the Prairie. <laughs> yep. 
and the history that we have and the history that we're able to share when folks come through is just really a fantastic uh, experience. Bill, I heard you have a kitchen here. We do. We have a, a, a historic kitchen that would have been outside the home. It's an open hearth and we actually have some uh, folks over there that are doing a little bit of cooking. Would you like to come see? I would love to do that. So okay. stay with us. We're going to head to the kitchen next. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its oyster shell recycling program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife. Recreation. Lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry, covering half our state, all of our hearts. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. kitchen and they'll be cooking inside here um, on the on the hearth and so you've got a fresh garden going mm -hmm. this is the kitchen garden and you remember I was telling you about all of our wonderful volunteers that we have we have one in particular Miss Kathleen that spends a lot of time out here making sure that this garden is um, growing the types of, uh, of vegetables and herbs that would have been used um, on, a, on a plantation like this. It's not just having a garden, it's having a garden from this time period. So this yes, is very authentic what, experience. That's what, that's what we are going for. So that's the, the idea. You're eating what's here and you're eating what's off of the land that you're in. So um, between this, between the chickens that you may be raising, um, if you have maybe beef or maybe some hogs, but you know, the, the cane and the syrup and the sugar that comes from that, then um, you know, that's all what goes in and that makes your regular diet and it moves throughout the year. It changes depending on what's in right. season. So. Fresh, local, Louisiana ingredients. Yes. Tell me about your sunflowers. Well, the sunflowers is a, a program that the Ag Center um, grows and they put those up so that uh, largely for entertainment purposes for so folks can come out and do their pictures people love it they'll run um, three or four different uh, growings each year and um, it just it really adds to the uh, my enjoyment of driving out here every day you know honestly take a left at the sunflowers <laughs> mm -hmm. yummy hi how are you Thank you. We love kitchens. Oh, an open hearth fire. Absolutely. We are. We started our fire a little before eight so that we could get the coals ready uh, to actually be cooking on. We've done some bacon for breakfast and we've got the sausage over the crane just kind of slowly smoking. We've put um, a squirrel here in our tin kitchen reflected oven and it'll just bake over the day, over the course of the day from the reflected heat. Um, and 
then we're getting ready to start our hip to do, which is lost bread or fridge to what we would call fridge toast. Wonderful. I have actually tried squirrel brains. They were a delicacy. Well, what was the taste? Uh, texture sensation. <laughs> now the heart, you just want to say it was brainy. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't like the strong flavor that people think. It, you know, it wasn't gross. It was, it was just, it was, uh, it was a texture thing. Yeah. It's a texture thing. It's, I can see how you could live on it, um, but at the same time, I'm glad there's options. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Have our collection that we preserve and that we keep and then we also have our collection that we use for teaching and so this is one of the this butter churn is one of the ones that we'll use for teaching well bill this is a fantastic experience i'm so uh -huh. excited that we got to come visit you today do you do this every year we are we are doing this and events like this each year so this is harvest days we'll also do one um, the first weekend in december that'll be a rural life christmas which will have some of the same aspects to it, but also have more of a holiday theme to it. And then this next year, in 2020, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary of the museum. Congratulations. Thank you. So we plan on bringing a, an event like this to the spring, and so we're going to have it in the spring as well. Well, you heard it from so. him, so make sure you come out and join them. This is a beautiful, beautiful day, and Harvest Days is going this weekend, but we've got one coming up Christmas. So thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on Field to Feast. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, Louisiana Crawfish, Ask Before You Eat, and by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Before we go, we want to take a moment to talk to you about Thanksgiving. This is my favorite holiday. It's the season of giving thanks, a time when Americans gather with their families and reflect upon the many blessings we have. One of those blessings is an abundant and affordable and safe food supply. America's farmers and ranchers take great pride in answering the call to serve our families, neighbors, and nation by growing a wholesome and sustainable set of products that we rely on every day. And farmers don't ask for gratitude. Farming is just what they do. It's in their blood, it's their job, and it's their passion. But this year has been particularly challenging in the ag community. Low prices, bad weather, and trade issues have many farmers depressed, both mentally and financially this season. Even when times are tough, Farmers and ranchers support and encourage each other throughout the year, every year. They band together through every kind of storm while still hoping for better days. So this Thanksgiving, we ask that you slow down, reflect and give thanks for more than just the turkey. Remember the farmers and ranchers, the 2% of the nation who work the land so that you and I don't have to. Thank you today and every day. Yeah, we wouldn't have the jobs we do if it weren't for farmers because we would be out having to grow right. our own food. Well, we're going to take the week of Thanksgiving off here at Twyla, so if you see this show again next week, that's why. We hope you take the time to enjoy and appreciate your family and friends as well. For all of us here at Twyla, we're thankful for you, our viewers. Thanks for joining us, and on behalf of the entire Twyla staff, Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.